Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Gates. Uh, I'm a program manager at Public Digital, where I lead our partnership with ODI on the Digital Public Finance Hub. Did more on that later. Um, welcome to our last session of the day. Um, it's been a lively conference so far, and I, I see that we have quite a few uh, faces still in the room, so we're hoping to finish out strong. Um, this one will dive a little bit more into the digital government side, um, tackling issues like digital public infrastructure, using digital public goods, establishing central digital teams, uh, and employing agile delivery me methods. Um, unlike Kahal and many of our ODI colleagues, I come from a background in digital government, not public finance, um, but I'm increasingly interested in looking at the opportunities to find common cause uh, between my field and public finance. I think we've seen a lot of great examples of that today. Uh, that said, there's just so much happening in the practice of digital government these days, much of which we've only begun to highlight um, in the previous sessions. Uh, this morning, we heard the view from inside finance ministries, uh, as well as the view from practitioners working on the outside of those ministries. We later saw uh, some exciting use cases for demand-driven PFM reform and had some deep dives on key topics and sectors that summarize some exciting opportunities for digital PFM modernization uh, in sectors. As mentioned before, uh, this session uh, will be a little bit more on that frontier edge of digital government and we'll look at its implications for PFM. Uh, to do so, we have a great panel lined up for all of you. Uh, we have some exciting speakers, all of whom have been pushing on that frontier in different ways. Um, we're going to start off by turning to each of our panelists and diving a bit deeper into some of those frontier approaches and technologies um, through some uh, presentations. Uh, we'll then follow that up with a discussion um, around opportunities in space, and we'll end with a Q&A like we did with the other sessions. So um, let me start off by introducing our panelists. Um, first up, all the way down to my right, uh, we have uh, Gerardo Yunya. Uh, Gerardo is a senior economist at the IMF Fiscal Affairs Department, where he leads the FAD Capacity Development Strategy Support Team. Uh, there, Gerardo leads on digital innovations and public financial management initiatives at the FAD. In his role, Gerardo provides technical assistance to governments in Latin America, the Caribbean, Africa, and South Asia on treasury management, public investment management, and digital solutions to improve fiscal management. Gerardo has previously worked at the Ministry of Finance of Chile, the Ministry of Finance of Argentina, and the Ministry of Finance of Paraguay. Um, to my right, we also have Gavin Heyman. Um, Gavin is the Executive Director of the Open Contracting Partnership, where he leads OCP's collaboration across government, business, and civil society to open up and transform public um, open contracting and public procurement. Gavin was previously director of campaigns and then executive director of Global Witness, um, overseeing the organization's investigative campaigning and advocacy work. Gavin has also helped create the international Publish What You Pay campaign, negotiated the Intergovernmental Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, quite a mouthful, and is generally <laughs> renowned as an expert on illicit financial flows. Um, to my left, uh, we have Kirsty Innes. Uh, Kirsty is the Director of Digital Government Unit at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. There, Kirsty focuses on digital government and the wider internet era infrastructure. Kirsty has previously held a range of roles working on economic and international policy and central government, uh, including Head of Markets at HM Treasury and Head of the Economic and Social Team at the British Embassy in Paris. Um, after Kirsty, uh, we have Anir Chowdhury, uh, all the way to my left. And here is the policy advisor of the H2I program of the ICT division and the cabinet division of the government of Bangladesh, uh, which is supported by both UNDP and the Gates Foundation. There, Anir leads the formation of a whole of society innovation ecosystem in Bangladesh through technology deployment, capacity development, policy formulation, institutional reform, and innovation. Anir has co-founded several software and service companies, as well as nonprofit organizations in both the United States and Bangladesh, and he is a regular speaker in international conferences on public service, innovation, and reform. Uh, so, Gerardo, I think I'm going to start off with you. Uh, so, Thanks too much. I'll uh, start off by just kind of asking you a general question, which is that there's a policy dimension um, to all of the issues that we've been talking about today, uh, with institutions like the World Bank and the IMF doing a lot to shape fiscal policy in countries. In this kind of broader context, um, the IMF is investing a lot of attention and effort into new guidelines on digitalization and PFM. Uh, which I'd love if you could speak to briefly. Uh, but I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the priorities countries are thinking about at the moment, especially under the current macroeconomic constraints that they operate in. And do you think the guidelines like this will help move towards the types of outcomes that we want to see out of PFM reform? Um, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. So maybe I could start with a more general um, introduction about how we are seeing the issues of digitalization in, in the FID. I don't know if we can put the presentation that I have, they have a couple of slides or- Yeah, you yeah. just got to break, yeah. But I, it's not my presentation over there. Yeah, so, yes, and if you go to the right, it will. Yes. Yes, okay, yeah. perfect. So um, let me give you first the, this 
general overview and then go to the to the questions that you just uh, asked me. Uh, the first issue that I would like to uh, share with all of you, it's uh, uh, from the IMF, we are trying to identify which are the macro fiscal impact of digitalization of public finance. And for us, there are at least four main aspects related to digitalization and, and, and fiscal policy. The first one is improving fiscal operation for citizen service delivery. And we have over there one experience that we did in Costa Rica. We did it with a Gates Foundation support, it was a hackathon that where we introduced a treasury system to consolidate the payments for cash transfer social programs. Then we think that also it's important for revenue mobilization. And you can see uh, one example related to Senegal. The third issue that is important for macro fiscal uh, uh, issues, it's the strengthening the fiscal transparency and governance. And the last one, it's uh, the bolstering global trade. And in that area, the custom uh, agencies has an important role. So what we want to show in this slide is that digitalization of public finance should be part of the macro fiscal discussion. It's a support to achieve macro fiscal stability and to promote macroeconomic stability. So it's not that if we just speak about digitalization itself as a separate uh, initiative without be connected with the macro fiscal implications, we think that we will not achieve all the gains that we can do it in, in this sense. We are seeing some opportunities for digitalization of public finance. We think that uh, these digital building blocks, it's uh, open new opportunities for the projects for digitalization. Let me go to the yellow box. Uh, there is a lot of discussion about this digital public infrastructure, digital public goods, COPS type initiatives. For us, the most important thing is that all of them share the idea of having a digital building blocks. And these digital building blocks, it's the most basic component that you need to uh, develop to solve the core and the critical issues of the public finance. There is a uh, an amazing experience with this approach in India related to the uh, DPIs on, on mostly focusing on, on financial inclusion. We think that that approach could be adopted in public finance. We are still thinking which could be these building blocks for public finance. Uh, since I came from a, an institution like IMF that we are almost all economists, for us, this concept of public has some specific meaning. So we think that in the case of digital public infrastructure and digital public goods, these are, in fact, it's a public provision of private goods. And, and it's not a public, in general, public good in general, like the public finance literature established. We also think that these emerging technologies allows developing countries to leapfrog. Uh, we think that the developing countries can follow a different path than the um, developing economies. And the third uh, opportunity is related to digital money. Uh, central bank digital currencies and fintech applications will be an important triggers to promote the digitalization of public finance, uh, and especially after the pandemic. Uh, we can see across different countries that the government responses for the emergencies were done through fintech applications. And that is something that it makes sense. The, the, the citizens has a relationship with the private sector, mostly electronically, and the, uh, and the public sector should be aligned with the same dynamic. We also see some uh, enablers for digitalization of public finance. As I mentioned, the COVID-19 has accelerated the digitalization of the society in general. And I think that the government should follow that tendency. It's important to have in place uh, a conceptual design, a business process redesign, adjustments in the chart of account, as uh, Penny mentioned it this morning, connectivity, network, hardware, all these basic uh, um, institutions should be in place for digitalization. If not, we can do faster the wrong things and we need to avoid that. And we think that adopting a modular approach that is something that we are promoting is an emerging strategy across different countries. We don't think that 
to implement a digital solution from the scratch is the best approach. We think that all the countries have certain kind of uh, system in place, and the most cost-effective uh, initiative is try to implement and try to improve what they have. Uh, in that sense, we are working on these uh, digitalization guidelines for digital uh, solution for public financial management, again, with uh, support from Gate Foundation. And tomorrow we will discuss more details about that. We think that uh, adopting the modern approach in combination with these guidelines on how the functional aspect of the system should be supported by the IT solutions is a good way to, to move forward. There is some constraints for digitalization of public finance. We discussed in the, in the several panels that uh, sometimes these projects are seen as just IT solutions instead to be seen as a modernization of government operations, and that's a mistake. Uh, if you just tackle this as an IT project, you will not achieve the results. We also discuss uh, across the day that this fragmented approach, and this fragmented approach is an issue for this for these projects, not only in the government, when we find that there is, as I was mentioning this morning, that one uh, agency has its own system, the Ministry of Finance has another one, and the, the exchange of information between them is quite complicated. But in many countries also, there is not a, a national digital strategy, and that is, a, that is a weaknesses. And I think that the connection between the national digital strategy and the public finance digitalization initiative should be strengthened. But also there is a fragmented issues related, uh, across the development partners. And we could find that the different development partners has different approaches, has different incentives, and it's important to try to have the same message and try to be more coordinated in this, uh, in this, uh, in this area. And another important uh, constraint is the digital divide. Uh, and the digital divide is present between the countries and across the countries. So if we don't tackle the digital divide, the uh, digitalization of public finance also cannot reach the entire citizens, entire population and, and, and all the, the stakeholders that we are thinking which is the, the issues that we are, we are looking. We all, and most of the people that are in this, in this room, we, are, uh, we think that the digitalization has a lot of uh, benefits, but it's quite difficult to try to find case studies on digitalization and have a, a strong case studies with the baseline and with the impact at the end. So I think that we as a community of practice need to develop these case studies and need to show which are the results, which are the impacts, and also which are the challenges and which are the failures of these kind of initiatives. We need to continue uh, to produce this analytical work to underpin the field work. And in that area, this idea of digital building blocks for public finance, it's, uh, it's a priority for the, for the IMF. We think that going more in detail of this concept of uh, fiscal data exchange, fiscal ID, it's important. And, and we think that that could be the core models to modernize the, the PFM and the public finance in general. And also the issues related to data management and cyber risks are important. We just discussed it in the, in the room, the break room about the data management, the online and the real time indicators, how important it could be to produce better information and better uh, policy decision making. But at the same time, we are promoting digitalization. We are saying everything needs to be in the systems, but we are opening the window for cyber risk. And we need to also advise the countries in that sense. We also need to show which could be the problems and which could be the risks uh, if you are going in, in a digital um, uh, ecosystem. And finally, uh, we need to strengthen and expand the digital public finance networking. We need to, to strengthen the supply side, because when we are uh, trying to identify experts in these areas, institutions, agencies involved are quite few. But also we need to strengthen the demand side. We need to involve in this discussion the governments, because if we don't involve the, the, the clients in this discussion, we will come up with some solutions that maybe uh, doesn't cover the necessities of the, uh, of the countries. So, um, we are working in this area, 
we think that this uh, digitalization uh, guidelines will help. Nowadays, we are working with Vietnam. We already implement a pilot in South American Principe. We also did a mission in Chile uh, to try to test these uh, guidelines. So uh, our final goal is try to publish uh, in the following months these guidelines. And after that, we want to put their guidelines in the public domain and free access to wherever we want to use it, uh, because we think that this could be a kind of digital public good to enhance the entire ecosystem. So I will stop here and happy to answer any question. Thank you, Gerardo. Um, I think just following up on that very briefly, um, and you don't have to offer you know, kind of too much before we move on to our next panelist, but I, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the importance of digital for kind of larger macroeconomic stabilization objectives um, and kind of that larger global context that's happening around uh, public finance right now. Yeah. It's important for, for the uh, macro fiscal stability, improved efficiency and the transparency on the public spending and the sustainability of revenue mobilization. And we think that one key component to achieve that is the digitalization of government operations. So, but we need to strengthen the connection between these two concepts and these two objectives. In, in many countries, as I said before, we just, uh, we see that the digitalization projects are IT projects and are not connected with the fiscal policy, are not connected with the fiscal objectives, and also are not connected with the service delivery to the citizens. So um, it's important to uh, strengthen that connection. And I think that in the following months, maybe the global economic situation will be a little uh, turbulent to say in some way. <laughs> so uh, it's important to, uh, and we saw in, in the, during the COVID that the countries that were uh, better prepared in digitalization have better results to achieve and to reach the, the citizens. So uh, if the global situation goes in the same direction, maybe we could, we could find that situation. And, and it's important to start to work now on strengthening the, the fiscal operations with digitalization tools. Thank you. Um, well, I think you set us up very well, um, touching on the broader global context, but also kind of some of these uh, new approaches, DPG, DPI, GovSAC, um, that you might be hearing over and over again. Um, Kirthi, I wanted to turn it over to you next. Um, so kind of reflecting on your work at the Tony Blair Institute, um, one of the trends that we see emerging in modern era digital government governance is these more open and modular architectural approaches to building digital tools and processes for service delivery. Um, these come in many forms that we've talked about and alluded to already, whether it's componentized architectures, the use of open source, a greater emphasis on protocol standards, uh, a focus on government as a platform, uh, what we, or what now we call um, digital public infrastructure. Are any of these trends or something else that I might have discussed um, particularly relevant for PFM reform? And what might some of the barriers to using these new tools and approaches be uh, in practice? Yeah. Oh, yes, in short, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> no, um, I mean, I was going to start by saying that I think the papers that ODI and Public Digital put out today are super compelling and convincing in um, making clear that a new paradigm for digitalization of public finance management is both necessary and possible. Um, and I think the conversations we've had today about the specific um, challenges and opportunities that come up when you're trying to put that into practice um, have helped to definitely put a lot of um, sort of flesh on the bones of those ideas mm. for me. Uh, and if our job in this session is to put that in the context of a bit of a broader theory of digital government, I think we couldn't have chosen a better topic because I think that public finance management digitalization is like the kind of end of level boss or <laughs> apex predator of digitalization projects in that the challenges are, um, you know, are extreme and are, are very difficult, but the opportunities are huge. So I think we all, we all have got a good sense of those from benefits for transparency and for openness, um, for policymaking to be better informed and more responsive, um, for anti-corruption and for just efficiency of, um, of, of managing public money. Um, but doing all that while you're still running the system, uh, paying, mm. paying for goods and services and keeping the country's finances running is um, maybe a bigger task than anything else I can think of in the digitalization space. And it made me think that um, people in this room have got lived experience of this, so feel free to chuck brickbats and things. But 
my interpretation is that the revolution that was driven in the UK by the government digital service started with this very sensible approach of, okay, well, let's pick specific discrete bits of service and we're going to, and ideally Greenfield, and we're going to transform those and we'll demonstrate our, the value of our approach and we'll deliver merit for citizens and, and then we'll progress from there. And that was very successful. Um, but it hasn't delivered its full promise in that the implicit sort of promise in there is that it would then work its way inward and kind of those um, values and approaches of um, agile product design, user-centered um, product design, um, funding teams, not projects, all those kind of things would start to infiltrate and sort of infuse into the, the wider government ecosystem. And it, it hasn't really, I don't think, reached the deep state yet for some very understandable reasons. I think, you know, which a lot of which you set out in the papers, um, finance ministries can have very uh, kind of stable is the complementary word or stubborn or inert culture. <laughs> it would be the, the less complementary way of saying it. And they can be optimized for risk management rather than for innovation. Uh, and all that makes it challenging to, um, to drive a, a big ambitious project. And so I think the, the digitalization of public finance management embodies three of what I think are the, the sort of classic challenges with any digitalization. So one is the scale of your ambition. How are you gonna scope the project so that it's, it's doable and it's um, it's not overwhelming and it doesn't do, it doesn't uh, it doesn't sort of put people off at first sight uh, and some of the modular approaches that Harada was just evoking sound super promising to me and I would like to to ask more about those. Um, <clears throat> the second is about competence and skills and how do you make sure you've got the right balance of expertise inside the finance ministry um, compared to external partners. Um, Henny, you talked about uh, this morning about how a lot of procurement of COPs uh, can be um, <clears throat> about government clients um, taking on something that was designed originally with a private sector client in mind and, and sort of developing it for their own needs. And that might be at one end of the scale where you're sort of, you, you know, you're putting maybe too much emphasis on the expertise from the private sector, but neither do you want to be in the position of the kind of maybe apocryphal but famous story of the local government um, authority where Derek is not allowed to retire because he's the only guy that knows how to run the software. So, you know, it's been around longer than he has. Um, that's when you've got to, you're too much reliant on too small a pool of expertise in house, and that's the kind of I think it's one of the great strategic challenges of all digitalization projects. And then the third is about making it real for citizens, where I think from all the case studies we've heard, it's very clear to us in this room what the benefits are. But translating that into something that as a politician, you could say in a speech or um, you could say on a doorstep is super challenging, not least because it might involve exposing some of the inadequacies of the sausage factory as it currently stands. <laughs> and, you know, admitting to people, well, actually, at the moment, our ability to keep track of where the money is going within government is not where we would want it to be. Um, and the, you know the improvement we're trying to get to is something that you might imagine we already had um so i think those things are all incredibly um important to resolve and i think the the drivers are there because the, the prize is so it's so great and i think some of the, the um the approaches you talked about in your remarks just now are the right ones to be pursuing to try and um uh, to try and make progress on all this stuff and i think i'm just agreeing and repeating what gerardo said about how the path forward has got to be about identifying case studies and sharing those and um, and taking away lessons from them. What, you mentioned publicizing successes and also failures, and it reminded me that I think it's the Netherlands is running its, um, for a second time, its prize for failure in public services, which I think is a brilliant initiative and something that should be absolutely uh, universal amongst governments. Um, I'll stop there, but keen to get into all of this in a bit more detail. So uh, there's a few different kind of emerging approaches. Uh, one is digital public goods, um, which is kind of open source uh, software, generally exists at kind of the, the service or the software level. Um, more foundational digital public infrastructures, there's this GovStack approach, um, the concept of kind of building blocks and microservices. Of all of these, do you see any as having the most resonance for public finance or PFM? Um... I think I think all of those things are useful. I think uh, this is another thing that I I would like to I'd like to hear the responses from the people in the room. But it strikes me that there's a bit of an odd difference between the way we talk about these 
things in what used to be called a development context or when we're talking about international organizations supporting lower and middle income countries versus how we're having the conversation in richer countries hmm. uh, and I think that we are at the stage where actually taking into account the kind of challenge of overcoming legacy systems and um, sort of you know some of the fraught political context some of the OECD members are in a um, more difficult position than some more lower income countries when it comes to adopting some of these more novel models. Like I was contemplating the other day, like why, why wouldn't the UK embrace a digital ID based on MOSIP? You know, like it, it hard, it's hard to imagine, but, like, but why not? So I, I think there are, um, there are some really interesting political uh, implications to all that kind of stuff that, um, that haven't been particularly well discussed as yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, Anir, I think I want to move to you next and get a little bit more of a, a practitioner's perspective. So Kirsty alluded to three issues. So that's kind of the scale of reform, um, the need for competence and skills, um, as well as the need to make it real to citizens. Um, and then Gerardo also spoke to some of that, that broader framing um, for policymakers. So uh, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, you know, some of the emerging tools available to policymakers. You're a policy advisor for the government of Bangladesh uh, to start reforming PFM processes. And maybe you could talk a little bit more about what they mean for finance ministries and central government digital service teams in particular. Um, over to you. Thanks, Nick. Actually, I realized that my eyesight is failing me. So if I may just stand there so that I can see that screen. Of course, yeah. I have two of you with this, right? Mm -hmm. can, can people hear me? Just hold the microphone yeah, up a bit. So. Yeah. OK. They won't hear you on live. Ah, right, 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 right. Of course. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Um, how do I get to my slides? Just sit right on there. Yeah. Ah, great. Wonderful. So let me start with Bangladesh, which is my country, where we've been doing a digital transformation effort for the last uh, almost 15 years now, since the uh, <clears throat> announcement by the Prime Minister to build a digital Bangladesh at a time when we had about maybe $600 per capita income uh, less than 1% internet penetration. So that was 2008. And if you look at the GDP per capita growth, it's, it's actually risen quite consistently. Even during COVID, we had, we had quite consistent growth, even when our uh, neighbors and many, many countries had negative growth. But if you look at the right picture on the right side, the, the actual implementation of budget is declining. So we have, we have a larger budget, but the percentage of budget uh, in 2000, 11, we were able to utilize 97% of the budget. Now we're able to use, even though with a larger budget, we're able to, able to use about 85% of the budget. So what really happens? So obviously our public finance management is not working as well as it did before. It should be, it should be improving. Um, <clears throat> there are a few lines I wanted to take from our uh, PFM reform strategy. Uh, the, uh, there are some honest admissions here. <laughs> that we inherited uh, a model from the colonial times. That's what we are promoting still. So paper-based, rule-based, not innovative. Uh, we have done decades of reform with some improvements, but not expected uh, delivery. Some progress in terms of medium-term budgeting, macroeconomic forecasting. So those have happened, but in terms of deficiency, in terms of FMIS, uh, uh, in terms of internal controls, fragmentation of the budget, and fragmentation is everywhere. You know, I'll, I'll talk more about that. Lack of transparency. So these are, these are areas where we need to do a lot more work. <clears throat> Some of the milestones that we're looking at in the next eight years, actually, I mean, not just 10 years, 20 years. Uh, one is now dealing with the uh, socioeconomic impact of COVID. We're dealing with the financial crisis, uh, the global scale. Uh, we also have a challenge coming up in 2026, which is LDC graduation. So we'll graduate uh, as an L, from an LDC to a, to a developing country. The process has been continuing for the last few years. Uh, obviously, SDG achievements by 2030. 2041 is, it, is a year uh, announced by the Prime Minister to become a high-income country for Bangladesh, a, a massive, massive challenge going from right now about 2,800 uh, to about 12,500 if dollar is the is the is the benchmark maybe crypto will we'll find something else i don't know and then we have a long term plan uh, 2100 because bangladesh is the largest delta in the world 
uh, very climate vulnerable, will actually disappear if you don't do the right things. Uh, so that's what we call the Delta plan. And there is a long term. Uh, we started this about a few years ago, so almost an eight year plan, uh, which we're working uh, with uh, uh, the Dutch government on. I wanted to just put up uh, some of the large areas. So ADP is our annual development plan. So this is where the projects get passed by the planning commission, not by the finance ministry. So I'll, I'll show you the, the sense of uh, fragmentation within the government. I think this is not dissimilar to other countries, but I just wanted to bring that up. So this is a typical uh, year where we have a lot of infrastructure, uh, financing, health, but you will see at the bottom is education and technology, only two to 3%. So we want to increase this, but how, where would we take the money from? We have $100 that's allocated across all these. So what kind of modeling can we do to make sure that we can put more money so education becomes 4% perhaps? We don't know. We, we, we don't have the right data to do this modeling. Uh, <clears throat> so I talked about modeling. Uh, there are a few other important things. And I think Gerardo, you talked about the second one that I, that I, that I showed there is that we will, we will continue to grow, but we actually will create more divides in society. So that's a stated goal of the nation that we want to uh, reduce divides, economic divides, digital divides, social, uh, social divides, all of that. Uh, there is a stated goal to become a business-friendly PFM so that private sector investment from within the country and outside can actually come in. Uh, we have a stated goal to become more and more participatory to promote participatory budgeting at the local level. Uh, and then integrity, transparency, that's important. And the sixth one, I think all of us since the morning talked about linking, budgeting, planning, and implementation. This is a very busy slide. Uh, actually, I broke it up so that they come in sequence, but since it's all coming together, I would uh, draw your attention to the top one, which is finance ministry. So finance ministry does, the, does what it does. I mean, you all know this. So there is an integrated budgeting and accounting system. So I just wanted to show what has been built in the last 10 years. So there is an integrated budgeting and accounting system with focus on debt management, macroeconomic forecasting. There's also gender expenditure reporting. Then we come to the national board of revenue, which does the taxation. So tax, VAT, uh, there is recently we did introduced uh, e-tax filing, VAT registration for the small businesses and also for the large businesses. Then comes the Ministry of Public Administration, which does the payroll for the entire government. So that's HR function. This is all very important, by the way. So this is all databases, digital silos. Uh, then we have the Central Bank, Bangladesh Bank, 20 plus ministries and private sector, mostly mobile money operators. So Bikash, as you know, is one of the largest operators in the world, uh, growing uh, like crazy, and they provide the infrastructure for our G2P, government to person payments. We started digitizing our uh, social safety nets in 2017. We introduced uh, a pilot of about 100,000 people across three ministries. COVID accelerated that hugely. So during COVID, actually just before COVID, we introduced the eKYC policy, so electronic KYC. And that helped us create millions of mobile wallets and bank accounts during COVID. And that allowed us to digitize the entire social safety net. About 30 million people get their money digitally now. Uh, then the Planning Commission, which is a very important arm of the government, uh, which does project approval. So large projects, infrastructure, small projects, uh, they all get approved by the planning commission and the project approval cycle often is very long because it's mostly done on paper recently uh, the ministry has started piloting with 10 ministries uh, a project appraisal system online and we'll see how i mean it's actually going to reduce the time by about two-thirds so what used to take a year will take about four months perhaps now in in because it's going to be done digitally uh, that ministry also does implementation monitoring. So there's a lot of uh, reports that come in from all the different ministries that are all the line ministries, agriculture, health, what have you. And that's mostly paper-based. So these reports come in, they come in electronically, but they're processed manually. Uh, then we have the central procurement unit, which does a lot of e-procurement, about 65 to 70% of the goods and uh, infrastructure work is done 
digitally. Now procurement is done digitally, but not the services. So when we talk about digital projects, a lot of it is actually services projects. So most digital projects are not done through procurement because they're all service, service procurement. Then comes the cabinet division, which is the super ministry that presides over all other ministries. We have something called the annual performance agreement. So that's a contract that the ministry, cabinet ministry signs with all the line ministries. And that's sort of a parallel appraisal. That's a parallel monitoring system uh, to the planning ministry. And there is a dashboard, there are awards given by the prime minister for the best performers. Uh, the cabinet division also supports an ERP system called digital NOTI. NOTI means filing. So it's an ERP for the entire government right now. So that also has a lot of electronic data flowing through it. And the last but not least is the local government institutions, uh, 4,500 rural and about 300 plus urban. And they have their own system, mostly paper-based, but several hundred of them actually have uh, uh, digital systems and there is no interoperability there is no data standards none of that so this forms the the core of the public finance management in bangladesh or a lot of it digital but not integrated and then if you look at the the red uh, uh, circle there that's the bureau of statistics which has an open data portal that we built and an sdg tracker which actually publishes public data so a lot of this data actually flows through about 92 departments of the government sends data to the open portal and the SDG tracker. So what does this all mean? Oh, I wanted to mention this before I say what this, what that all means is that we are now exploring a, a quite an innovative approach that we adopted from Togo uh, in terms of using uh, cell phone data to do real time poverty tracking. So this professor at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, did a theoretical paper a few years ago that 960 parameters of phone usage, so duration of call, SMS, uh, time of call, top-ups, all kinds of things, can be used to understand how people's behavior, cell phone usage behavior actually changes based on poverty status. So it was proven quite uh, successful in Togo during COVID to reduce inclusion and exclusion errors. And we are now trying this in Bangladesh. So this will this is another PFM system for targeting social safety net beneficiaries. Now, if you look at what really happened, the arrows became boxes here. Uh, so just imagine those boxes are arrows. So we went from paper to Excel to digital silos. We're not there in the federated digital model yet. So essentially, we have not changed anything fundamentally. So what was in paper? So Minister of Finance, what it did on paper is doing on digital silo. Minister of Health, trying to do health financing, health insurance for universal health coverage, again is asking for things it did 10, 20 years ago. Used to do it on paper, now it's actually doing it digitally. So it's, it's not integrated. So there is not somebody looking at all these different PFM requirements and then connecting the dots. So that's, that's, that's something that we need to do. So if you look at some of the old problems, obviously we talked about these things throughout the day. So there are turf control. I don't want to share my data. Uh, capacity is lacking. So in terms of dealing with digital, dealing with uh, sharing data, there is human capacity in a department that's lacking. There is fear of change. Uh, the data formats are completely fragmented. There is no standard that we have been able to uh, institute across the board. The reporting requirements by different, uh, I, I showed you that, that sort of uh, plethora of agencies that have different reporting requirements. And there are reporting requirements by the development partners, World Bank, IMF, ADB, they have reporting requirements and they're completely different. And there is obviously uh, development partner fragmentation and politics that's also play a role here in this whole thing. So what it creates is multiple sources of truth. So we have, uh, how many people do we have in Bangladesh? There are actually multiple sources of truth for that. So there is census and there is a lot of other information that's coming from real time from the telcos, from our mobile financial service operators. And then we've created some new problems there as well. So solutions that we have adopted or bought or created looking to solve a problem we have not created problem-centric solutions. Um, we talk about Agile quite a bit, but uh, Agile for a, when we are applying it to a legacy monolithic architecture doesn't often work. So you can't really layer it. 
right? So it's, it, it, it just breaks down because, I mean, you could be doing agile, but you can't really build systems on a monolithic architecture. There is the new debate now, what is DPG, what is proprietary, what makes sense, whether there is DPG that's supported. And we are working closely with the DPG Alliance and also GovStack and trying to understand this debate well. Uh, then there's a lot of non-government data. During COVID, we actually used a lot of cell phone data, a lot of mobile financial services data from the private sector to track the disease even. And obviously for socioeconomic recovery issues. So a lot of big data issues are coming up. Privacy concerns, we talked about that in the morning. And then expectation of modeling within our PFM system that we want to prioritize better just by doing some forecasting and modeling. That's also a new problem. Uh, what I want to end with, and I'll take maybe two, two, two three more minutes if that's okay, Nick, uh, is a stack approach that we created for our digital governance. Basically, uh, there are five layers of this stack. And if you look at the, the top layer, the services layer, that's what people see. So the land ministry, the ministry of transportation, finance, uh, taxation, immigration. So all of them actually, and then users see that services layer, if you see at, at the top. But there are four other layers underneath that. So if I start from the very bottom, that's the access layer. So how do people actually access services? Wireless, wired, but we also in Bangladesh created thousands of what are called digital centers. So these are centers where people go and pay a small fee to access birth registration or a loan or apply for a passport. So analog citizens apply for digital services because they may not have the right device. They may not be able to afford data connectivity. They may not be able to have the right skills. So they go to this center. So that's the access layer. The layer on top of that is the identity layer. And there is a lot of discussion about uniquely able to identify a person. That's true for health. That's true for financial services as well. The layer on top of that is the payments layer. So payments for uh, government to the citizens, for instance, the social safety net, and also for citizens to make uh, payments to the government. So it's, it's bi-directional payments layer. And then the fourth layer, the orange layer, uh, is where the magic happens in terms of data interoperability. So that's where PFM actually resides. But then all the other layers also have relevance to make PFM work for the people. So if we take that stack and abstract it for, let's say, agriculture or education or health, this is what it sort of looks like. I won't go into the details of this, but the idea is that this stack works for any of the sectors. And what I propose is that we can actually work together to build a similar stack for PFM. Maybe what we learned from IFIX and many of the other examples that we talked about today, maybe we can actually learn important lessons from that. So this is sort of the the data layer, if we actually uh, uh, flesh this out, we have the digital records at the very bottom, the health registry, the land registry, so on and so forth. The data exchange layer, which is where the exchange of data actually happens across different ministries. And on the top is the data service, which is where analytics, even predictive and artificial intelligence actually can play a role. So this is sort of the, the stack within a stack within the data layer. This is the services layer. I'll skip over that. And then the, my last slide is we have some technical issues and we have some non-technical issues. And they just happen to be seven and seven. I mean, I don't know why they are seven and seven, but they just happen to be that. So not hammer looking for a nail. So we have to make it problem-driven, demand-driven. The integrated, federated, and interoperable. So there's a federated model that we need to put where the central control will not be there. So each ministry, each department will have its own control, but they'll talk to each other. Data will talk to each other. The third one is uh, incorporate uh, many types of data that's coming from real time uh, and survey that's coming from our, our, our census uh, to ensure single source of truth. We don't have that right now, to be very honest. Uh, data standards, global and local. This is where I think this is the global platform. I was very, very happy to hear a lot of very uh, high level of synergy throughout the whole day. I was listening with interest uh, to everybody. Use of big data from the private sector. Uh, number six is uh, reference systems. So I think we could build reference systems, but we can't impose it on different departments. So we can say this is a, iFix is a good reference system, and maybe we will allow the different departments to customize it and, and support that, that effort. 
Um, the last point on the technical side is that building small pilots, but not get into this thing we just uh, talked about in, in uh, breakout one, not get into the, 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 the issue of pilotitis. A lot of pilots not leading to anything large. So we have to build uh, small, but have the longer term technical vision as well. On the right side, the non-technical side, we all talked about whole of government coordination a central systems design team, potentially one or more, but they have to think, they have to link health with education, with finance ministry, with cabinet. So if, if that linking is not done, then finance ministry won't be able to see what health ministry really wants. So I think somebody needs to link all these different demands. Uh, coordination among the, uh, the development partners, that, that's critical. And hopefully we'll talk about that in the next uh, couple of hours, maybe. Maybe one hour, actually, not a couple hours, sorry. Uh, uh, number five is uh, aggressive system integrators capacity development. So companies that will actually build this thing in a country or global SIs where the local capacity may not exist. So the aggressive uh, system integration capacity is, is, is important. Uh, and then developing a sense of DPI standards and systems, and then also bringing in the private sector into this whole mix, large private sector, small private sector, and perhaps the big techs globally. So my last two questions uh, is IFIX going to give us that? We, we may need to flesh that out. And then the PFM Knowledge Hub that was just launched, how can that help us in terms of uh, understanding where we want to head and how we can go there together? Thank you very much. So really just a ton to dive into there. Um, and I think we could spend the rest of the session dissecting that presentation. But uh, I think one of the emerging themes of this conference and you know of this session um, is kind of this tension between people and technology. Um, and so I think we see that in a lot of uh, project life cycles as well. Um, and I think it's perhaps most acute in PFM, um, but don't quote me on that. Um, but Gavin, um, kind of talking about and reflecting on this technology, you know, um, people divide. I'm a little curious what you think the conditions are for these new types of infrastructure and service uh, delivery to be successful for finance ministries, um, especially from a change management perspective. And then what might they mean for the teams actually working to implement them and how can we set those teams up for success? Awesome. These are great questions. Can I have the <laughs> clicker so I can show you a couple of pictures? So yeah. first of all, let me just quickly introduce myself. So Gavin Heyman, and I'm honored to kind of lead the Open Contracting Partnership. So we work on sort of reinventing public procurement from a kind of compliance and paper-based chore to being a smart digital public service. That's the kind of mission of the Open Contracting Partnership. We're really trying to do that through open data and open government approach to rethink how governments go shopping and do their business. Um, Kirsty, you had this great image of the end of level boss, right? <laughs> There's that moment for the end of level boss where suddenly it gets reconstituted even worse monster. Maybe that's public procurement after PFM, <laughs> right? It's like the, the edge of the edge of like difficult kind of challenges sometimes. Um, there's no one solution. We're all still learning what works. So part of our mission is to really collect together what's working and share with other people and to really measure the impact. So. Your question is what works? So these are some of the things that we've seen working across our kind of, um, our, we work in about 30 different countries. So you've got this great sticker here actually, which is like point number one, right? Teams before tech, we should all take this home, stick this on our laptops or on our phones and everything else, right? Really focusing in on both having diverse skills in the team, both working across the, the tech understanding, but the institutional navigation and navigating across government kind of different silos, and then having that link back to the political will and generating that and continually regenerating that. I think that's incredibly important. I think even more important the team is the goal to which the team is working. So it should also say goals before tech, right? Or mission before tech. What exactly are we trying to achieve? How do we set that clear objective of what good would look like in this context and everything else? Um, number two of what tends to work, really how to change power through multi-stakeholder collaboration, right? It's the politics, it always is. These things are fundamentally political in nature. There are winners and losers in all these digital transformations. So you really have to think that through. And then given all the kind of the work that's been done by the anti-corruption evidence program in the UK, that's been sort of trying to understand how you change that kind of paradigm, how you boost public integrity. It's really about working out how do you build 
a sufficient coalition of winners that they can kind of overpower their vested interests that block reform. So thinking about that fundamentally and working through the many different stakeholders in public procurement or public financial management, so you're able to build that sufficient coalition of change. That feels incredibly important and quite often perhaps overlooked. Number three, right, um, change management. We did a review of like five leading um, EGP reforms in Africa, just to look through what worked and what didn't. These were yeah, uh, locally owned, but often supported by the World Bank. And um, some of them were really quite indifferent in terms of their results. Speaking to those teams, the people at the coal face that transformation, they said their number one regret was not having a clear change management plan in place before they started. Number two regret, interesting, was not having a very clear team in place before the transition starts. It was quite often donor driven and then the team was put in place and already starting from behind. So that, that change management, thinking through the incentives, the training and support, the handholding, and also the, the way you're going to kind of perhaps uh, nudge people towards compliance and maybe it's not always nudges. So to give you an example of that um, in public procurement, for example, maybe your contract with a company is not legal until such time as you've published a public notice, the award notice of who you're awarding it to and how you're awarding it to them. So thinking those through and change management to drive that, particularly retesting what's going on and seeing if you're facing opposition, what you do about that and rethinking your plan is incredibly important. Number four, quite often missed, is rethinking business processes for the digital environment, right? You have this fundamental economies of scales and ways of <laughs> rethinking the whole business process, right, that can underpin PFM. And I think really thinking that through and not just taking paper-based processes in line. That happens all too often. So we're just like emailing documents. I, I, I thought you were saying, Amir, about that's still sometimes the case in the Bangladesh government. So what are those opportunities to fundamentally like re-engineer how we actually make decisions? And then you can obviously get things like the planning decision down from you know, one year to several months and everything else. And perhaps people can only tell you once when they're transacting with you, which would be amazing too. Number five, um, use of structured open data standards. So we support an open contracting data standard, which is the way of joining together all the information across public procurement, right? So one in every $3 spent by government. How do you track that through different government systems from the planning stage, as Mir was saying, through to the actual tender award and then the execution of contracts, which is actually the single most important part, of course. Um, and how you get your know, unique records and IDs that allow you to like, follow the money across the sort of the PFM silos. And open data standards can really help here, but you have to design for use, first of all. It's not just like that collecting and you know, data. What are you going to do with it? So we often talk about value for money and efficiency, public integrity, what are the red flags in public purchasing, for example? How do you track delivery of services to citizens? and the level playing field for business, um, and how you bring the data together and actually arrange it and use it. And I think um, obviously uh, PFM has some real power users like ministries of finance and others. And I think the virtuous circle of them using the data to improve their own work will improve it for everybody else. So how you get that kind of flywheel effect of people actually using the information you're providing. Um, and just lastly, to finish off very quickly, Bad procurement, right? This is one of the ironies that bad procurement will actually stop you procuring digital solutions to actually fix both procurement and wider PFM <laughs> things. So that's a there's some terrible irony here. But the general inequities in in public life, yeah, obviously spill over to procurement, inflexibility, over prescription, risk aversion, all these kinds of things. So how do you you rethink how you might actually procure and implement these solutions? And um, you know, Kirsty, I, I know your report really looked at that in a lot of detail, right? Trying to think through those different ways of actually talking to the marketplace to solicit new ideas and everything else. Um, moving on from that, um, I think it's also really important to think about the performance standards. Quite often people focus on the tech they're trying to buy. They're often using a World Bank procurement process that sort of um, tends to drive things towards our lowest price versus best value. So think those ones through. Um, legal reform right the digital may be agile but legal may not be so can you have agile legal reforms and maybe actually build the solution and then you pass the law that implements it rather than the other way around it's quite an interesting kind of a interaction between those two so simple example rwanda had a really good egp system electronic procurement system but banks wouldn't accept digital signatures so even though they were signing things digitally for companies they couldn't actually access the money or loans or anything else to help them finance delivering services to government because they didn't have um 
uh, yeah, like a digital signatures recognized by banks. So just thinking about that legal ecosystem, the policy ecosystem. And lastly, and this sounds really stupid, right? But it's um, planning for sustainability for your reforms. So you'd have a whole cycle of upgrades and actually investing in this technology, training people and everything else. And it's really surprising to me how often kind of danger driven reforms don't have that clearly centered. And there's a major part of it. You shouldn't be investing in this stuff unless you have a plan for what you're going to do to upgrade it over a period of years. And um, surprises me, but there you go. It's still very much the case. Um, I think lots of people are saying about case studies. Let me just give you a super quick one just to finish off. So this was Ukraine before the Maidan revolution using Soviet-based procurement methods, right? It's all paper-based. It's a, a nightmare to track what on earth is going on. When the Maidan happened, there was a real opportunity to rethink things. Um, and this is what Ukraine has now. It has a fully digital procurement approach, right? Um, it was really about government, business, civil society working together to rethink the whole process of public procurement, how you get risk analytics, red flags, how you do things digitally and everything else across the entire cycle of procurement. Um, for a cost of about $5 million to implement solution, the government saved about $6 billion. 1,000 new suppliers went to government. Something like 80% of contracts go to SMEs, which is like unheard of anywhere else in the world. In the UK, it's kind of approaching 30% and going slightly backwards. And there's embedded risk analytics and monitoring in there that's also publicly available. And it's now going to be a super important part of the reconstruction that enables Ukraine perhaps to think about how they can do the recovery and reconstruction differently and plan deliver projects in a really transparent way to the international community that will be supporting it in that reconstruction. So change is possible. Uh, I think one of your things says uh, build the team, not the app. Again, tech and data were a means to an end, not an end themselves. They had a really clear goal about improving um, yeah, the opportunities for small Ukrainian businesses in public procurement and tackling the cryptocracy they were through at the time. You need that relentless systematic engagement, public collaboration and public messaging, your communications budgets and all your tech innovations, PFN innovations are way too small as a general rule. So thinking through how they did that is about changing attitudes of the public and the business and everybody else. So I'll stop there. Hopefully that's some of the elements of what works. Great, thank you. Um, do you see any opportunities um, building on the SID of a standard for kind of uh, open standards or open data models for PFM? Yeah, I, I do. So obviously there's, there's things like the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency, right? There's already governments that have really great digitized open budget kind of processes. So I think there's a real opportunity to work out the threads of those and how you bring them together. So I, I know the um, open data standards there are more user centered and really thinking about how people are going to use the budgets, particularly around public service delivery. But yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I think that's one of the, the big next things we should be exploring precisely so there can be those global goods that will help people kind of uh, iterate, improve, and then also give a whole load of like free kind of tools that other people can adapt. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, well, I'll ask a question or two as, as kind of follow up, and then we'll we'll go to uh, our questions online and in the room. Um, I'm really interested in this idea of a whole of government approach versus actual whole of government kind of coordination in process. Um, so you've kind of seen what it's like to get different ministries on board um, in terms of a, a reform or a standard. <laughs> Um, Gerardo, you've kind of worked on some of these issues, cooperation between finance ministries and others, and you're, you uh, work in kind of a central innovation agency. I'm just kind of curious if anyone has any thoughts on kind of the, the tension between this idea of a whole of government approach and actually making it um, happen in practice. Um, would anybody like to go for that? Yeah, maybe I can start. Uh, we think that it's better uh, some more specific approach than a whole government approach. The political resistance to implement a whole government approaches are quite difficult. Also, the technology, if you try to implement a large um, IT system and in general organization system, it will take a long time. And the window of opportunity in the political cycle are short. So you need to take advantage of that to receive the support from the authorities. But you need to have a national digital strategy in place to have a one direction that try to coordinate all the initiatives. So I think it's an equilibrium between to having this general view in the national digital strategy and then go more tactical in more specific and pragmatic and practical uh, projects. So uh, that is my, my first reaction on that. 
Eu não. I'll just speak here. So three things I think uh, are important. They were important in the, in the case of Bangladesh. One is political will. Mm -hmm. I think uh, without political will, we had so much resistance in 2008 from the entire society. Poor country, we have not ensured uh, food security, we have not ensured clothing, housing, healthcare, education. We're talking about digitization. So I think political will, with a firm belief, that digitization will actually support socioeconomic development and will allow us to leapfrog. I think that firm belief was really important. Second was a tool to measure impact, some simple tool. For instance, we introduced for public service delivery digitization, a tool that we call TCV, time, cost, and visit. So reduction of time, cost, number of visits to access a service, any service. Uh, we just did a calculation in December. In the last decade or so, we saved citizens about 17 billion work days, about $22 billion, and about uh, 14 billion visits were eliminated. So this is a tool that every ministry, now it's become policy. Every ministry is asked to benchmark their service. So we have 7,000 services approximately. So each ministry benchmarks one service on TCV and shows improvement, iterative improvement every year. And the third is embedding. Uh, so more than strategy, I think it's it, because strategy seems like it's 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 a culture really. I mean, like Peter Drucker said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. It's 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 really that because strategy becomes ossified very quickly. So it's a, it's a regeneration innovation culture within civil service, uh, supported by the political will and supported by a central team that keeps on innovating continuously with, with tentacles in, in, in civil service. I think that, that is important. So civil service has a really important role to play in generating that culture of innovation and culture, and then digitization is part of that. It's really the innovation solving problems, specifically uh, looking at what the users need, what the citizens need. So those are the three things. Great. Um, and then lastly, uh, this one is a little self-serving, but um, we're kind of launching a new digital public finance hub today, which will be a learning and technical assistance uh, initiative facilitated by ODI with support from Public Digital. Uh, and we'll be working with countries on issues related to the intersection of digital delivery and public finance. So, you know, as we move forward and we really think about the intersection of these two topics, um, is there any one thing that you think about the, the hub focusing on? Um, Gerardo, you mentioned use cases, for example, um, but then anyone, um, does anyone have any thoughts? I have an ambitious thought. Please go for it. <laughs> if, if I mean, I don't know what the plans of this are. I think you were, you were talking about it. So obviously there could be knowledge sharing. I think that's that, that goes without saying, but if there is any way to even focus on some standardization from this, uh, it's an ambitious thought, and I think it will require a lot of people who spoke today, who listened today, perhaps to come together in some form, and we can sort of dissect uh, PFM. PFM is not one thing; it's it's actually many things, depending on who you ask. If you ask uh, planning ministry, they'll say one thing. If you ask finance, they'll say one thing. If you ask health, they'll say another thing. And these are all all important. These are all all true. So it's a many-sided prism. So if these different maybe working groups, if they come together, I don't know if such a thing exists for PSM, but the nexus of digital finance and digital governance. And Nick, you said that your background is digital governance, not, not PFM or finance. So I think the two need to come together in some form. And if this Knowledge Hub can do that, even in a, in, a, in, a, in a basic way, fundamental way, I think that'd be a great contribution. Oh, I think, uh, yeah, um, so, so obviously there's a real hunger for case studies. So documenting some of those, uh, yeah, like uh, sounds really great. I think helping people avoid the obvious pitfalls. So sounds smart too. So the one I can throw on the table is yeah, bad procurement, right? It's going to mm -hmm. stop you in your tracks even when you're trying to like think about your solutions. So how do you, how could you engage the market, you know, 
around a problem you want to solve and, and look for solutions rather than buying stuff off the shelf. And, and I think that that could be just a useful thing. So just helping people navigate around some of the obvious red flags and pitfalls or these best global guidance on this is go to X, Y, and Z would be really helpful. We had the challenge thrown out this morning, I think. I think it was Henny who said, you know, could a group of um, people working on this area develop um, their own model from a blank sheet of paper of what the what the systems and tools, the ideal sort of systems and tools would be that they would want to design uh, if, you know, if, if there was no um, constraints and, and use that as a, a counter to the kind of prevailing sort of market environment of, okay, Here's what, here's what we've already got that you can start with. Um, I think that'd be super valuable. Gerardo, what's your last thought? Uh, yeah, I think that um, we need to expand the connection between the public financial management and the service delivery to the citizens. And, uh, and also with revenue mobilization and, and, and the revenue side. So is this hub could present uh, more cases about that integration, I think it could be really helpful. If not, it would be just a, a side for us. And I think that's not the idea. I think that we need to expand the coverage and the, the audience. And if I may just a shout out to the um, mm -hmm. Inter-American Development Bank's Mapper Inversiones. It's a really good like public investment tool that they've really thought through, again, backed by open data standards, including open contracting, but just really mm -hmm. thinking through. And they've got some great case studies there in Costa Rica where it's actually crowding in investment and adding value. So again, yeah. so, so there's some inspiration examples out there for yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Uh, well, it's worth alluding to, we have two new working papers on these topics live on the ODI website, so we hope you all will check them out. Um, but yeah, we'll stop talking about that and we'll move on to questions from the audience. So uh, we can get started and pass the microphone around. Um, uh, anyone have a question? Uh, thank you. Um, Mark Miller from ODI. I so two questions. One is like PFM is a, a big thing. It's a big space. Uh, and we've heard, you know, we heard a bit in uh, the morning about pretty poor performance in terms of the quality of management information coming from systems. We've heard some nice examples of um, wins in open contracting. Do, you, do people have a view as to within the old, whole sort of PFM area, are there places that where like bets seem like smarter like where this stuff is maybe more valuable than others is it more valuable at kind of front line versus like core sort of accounting systems so any any views on that the second thing like this stuff increasingly eats up a lot of government budgets you know we, we did a con uh, conference i think seven years ago on uh, investment in infrastructure and there's a lot of parallels i've heard today about sort of investing in the road or the system and not investing in the maintenance issues with procurement contract management so i wonder are there any kind of lessons on how finance ministries or centers of government can actually get better value for money from their investments in digital thanks anyone else all right Uh, yes, I might just uh, give you some information about what the OECD is doing in this space. Um, we've uh, recently carried out a survey of uh, digitalization and financial management information systems in OECD countries. Um, I made a presentation on that at an OECD meeting a couple of weeks ago. We haven't completed the collection of all the data or the you know analysis and cleaning of the data but i think that may be a useful contribution and and uh going back to a comment that kirsty made about you know the situation in oecd countries one interesting fact is that you know 75 percent of the oecd countries had systems that were more than 10 years old and many of them have systems that are way older than that so I think there is a big issue around, you know, letting go of mother and moving on to, you know, modern, uh, more modern IT systems. Um, some of the other things we saw in that survey were, you know, familiar, you know, the fragmentation of systems, a huge number of systems developed, you know, on an ad hoc basis by 
for specific purposes. So the challenge of bringing all of that together um, and uh, a predominance of, you know, uh, out of the box box systems. Um, and I think what we've been hearing today is maybe need to move away from that kind of big box approach. A lot of good, a lot of sound arguments in terms of modular development for maybe thinking about development of finance IT systems in a different way. Um, we see a lot of actual decentralization of the financial management architecture. I think another thing to take away from this is the importance of getting the architecture right at the start. Um, you know, you have to have that what's at the core of the Ministry of Finance's IT systems. Maybe you need to adopt some kind of subsidiarity principle that, you know, certain things have to be at the center, but other things, maybe it's better to let line ministries, service delivery agencies develop their own solutions, provided they, you know, uh, can transfer the information that's needed by the center. Um, and, uh, you know, looking at what they're trying to develop, I think they're very interested in moving away from transaction, you know, time spent on transaction processing to analysis um, and using this data for to inform policy making and management of services. So that's a clear message that we take away. That's the direction that countries are trying to move and these systems will provide the opportunity to do that. So I'll leave it to that. And, and also we're developing quite a lot of we're developing case studies in addition on you know, different countries' experiences. So that's something else we hope to be able to share. I, I think we can take one or two more comments or questions and then we'll turn it back to our panel. The last slide sort of ended to where we started this morning with this means to an end story. We got the impression Gerardo and Nick got carried a little bit away with this macro stabilization business. So let's keep things separate. Okay. Digital produce better, faster, more reliable information. Government can still make stupid policy decisions. Let's let's <laughs> let's make it clear. Uh, just just for a matter of, of emphasis. Uh, yeah, political will, yes. But then one of your slides got me a little bit worried because in the end it's the long list of technical and non-technical. I, I, I learned the hard way there's hardly anything that can qualify as purely technical in this business. You touch information. The moment you do that is political. So let's not try to kind of elude ourselves that we can sort of go under the radar screen and do all these technicalities because again, and this brings me to actually the point, uh, like very much Kevin's presentation, I agree with 95, 98%. The only, the, only, the only thing that I was really puzzled as an interest concept is agile legal reform. I've never seen it. So, because once you open up the doors of parliament or Congress, or whatever political system, there's hardly anything that can be qualified as agile. So it's always my... My advice has always been try to extend to the extent that you can work under the screen via secondary good regulations. So in some country, you can do a lot in terms of practice, then eventually. Now, of course, it, it's highly contextual. You go to countries, if it's not in the law, it doesn't exist. So one has to be a little bit, if you could elaborate a little bit on this agile uh, uh, concept. On procurement, just a personal note, I think we met at ODI 15, there's nobody in the room at all, right? Just me. We, there was a meeting with on fragile states and loud and clear, they told us we need the light procurement. So countries, even advanced currency cannot cope with World Bank or EC type of procurements, but that, that cry has remained, stayed there. Nothing has been done. So again, something that perhaps should be revisited. And last point, I mean, all of you, rightly so, and even other speakers raised the issue of, you know, human capacity, capability, et cetera. I think, I think we need to think that there might be something for the help, perhaps. We need to think of a new generation of PFN specialists, for lack of a better world. So we really need people that really understand how the puzzle service put together. So they should really be aware of you know, the IT, the legal, of course, the economics, 
the accounting, and the auditing, and so on and so forth. There's basically no school in the world, graduate or postgraduate, that, that does that. So you know, all of us become in the end practitioners, learning way too often the, the, the hard way just by making mistakes, <laughs> which is okay, it's good. But so again, that's something for us is food for thought. We, we, we see where the hub can actually generate and, and push perhaps some, some of the universities to broaden a little bit the, 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 the narrowly defined PFM or IT or accounting or auditing again, sort of break up the silo, so to speak. Thank you. I think we can take one last question and then we'll conclude with our panel. Anyone in the room? Okay, thank you. My name is Gavin Imtei from Tanzania. So one of the things that is emerging since morning is uh, the necessity of linking this digital PFM solutions with the service, service delivery aspects. And uh, for most of the countries, the, the leaders in this uh, PFM transformations, in most cases, are ministries of, uh, of finance. And uh, so do, do we think the minister of finance is uh, taking this perspective, like whatever the PFM uh, reforms that have been done are really linked to the service delivery? Because my thinking is like most of the minister of finance is just thinking about getting the right numbers, getting controls, and you get the right financial reports. And especially why I'm thinking this is like most of the Ministry of Finance is still hanging on the line item, for example, line item budget control. So it's basically it's just to control based on the inputs. But I feel like there's no that push within the Ministries of Finance, at least to move to more like output-based budgeting, which can create more space to think about service delivery. And so to what extent like the, the giants like the IMF are starting to push the Ministry of Finances at least to start moving from these rigidities, at least to open that space to link the PF from the digital reforms with the service delivery. Thanks. Great, well, I do have a bit of recency bias. So I, I, I will start there because I think that is, is the million dollar question. So how do we actually link digital and service delivery in a PFM context? Is it is it really possible? Um, Gerardo, you've worked in several ministries of finance. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to you and, and see if you have any thoughts on that and then we'll turn it to the panel. Yeah, um, I think that the, the first issue is to split. what When we talk about the Ministry of Finance, we have several actors inside the Ministry of Finance with different incentives. When you talk with the minister itself about digitalization, it, he doesn't care too much. In my experience, when you started to talk with the minister, I said, we will implement a new system with this capacity. Said, okay, and with this result for me, you will get better information. Okay, I understand that, that part. So do whatever you need to get me better information. So I think that in, at the top level of the Ministry of Finance, that resistance, it's there, but we can change it without too many uh, restrictions. The constraints are at the level of your friend sitting to you, <laughs> just <laughs> behind uh, in the side you. It's, a, it's more the technical level that wants to control everything because that is the business that they do. But I think that the technology now, it's allowing us to produce the information that the treasury, the accounting and the budget office need in a different way. And that is, that, that is the approach that we want to promote. Uh, we need to embed the public financial management process in the line minister processes. It's something that also was mentioned in this morning. We need to avoid as much as possible the human intervention in the public financial management. We need to try to produce and try to capture the information from the financial transactions from the system of the sectors itself why we need to have an FMIS and why we need to have a health system that it's dealing with all the health sector business. And then the person needs to exchange the information or retype information in the FMIS. So I think that if we can go in that direction, we can improve how the functionalities and the services from the financial uh, information system to the line ministers, but it's a, it's a long way. It's not that we will do it now, but I think that we need to start in, in, in that in that, in, in that approach. Let me just talk a little about some of the issues that were arise, or you wanted to 
go up. Uh, like <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, Mark mentioned which are the other uh, key areas that we are talking about because we talk about uh, procurement, but I think that one important area is treasury payments. And that is an area that we need to focus our attention because it's a direct relationship between the government and the citizens and the government and the business. If you can improve it and if you can adopt the fintech technologies and also the central bank digital currencies in the future, the relationship will change a lot. So I think that is an area and important. And the second one is fiscal reporting because it's close related to governance. If we can improve the, the trust of the citizens in the government, we also will achieve better results and we can introduce um, some efficiencies in, in, the, in the fiscal operations. I think that besides the, the procurement, these two areas are, are important. And uh, the issue of uh, human capacity, yes, for sure. The, but you know better than me that PFM, it's a big uh, concept. So we need to do the effort to maybe establishing certain subdivisions of PFM because it's almost impossible to find somebody that knows about everything in PFM. Uh, but it's true that we need to generate new uh, capacities in, in PFM. I will stop here. Thank you. Um, Gavin, I want to turn it over to you and see if you had any reflections on the questions from our uh, speakers. And you can also address uh, the idea of agile legal reform uh, and elucidate <laughs> us on, on what that might entail. This was a great set of questions. So thank you. So um, <laughs> just let me deal with the agile one first. So yes, it's a great point. I think maybe in the primary legislation, you establish principles, right? And they stand, you know, like uh, hopefully for, for all time, right? And then maybe exactly as you said, the secondaries can be adjusted as knowledge policies and processes kind of improve over time. I was very struck by some of the innovations we've seen. They kind of built the system first and then worked out, okay, now what should the implementing regulations be to have everyone use it versus a test set of users? And I think just having that mindset that things should change versus you just take the law and you implement the law digitally can be quite helpful. So I hope that kind of ties up. I'm, I'm agreeing with you, split absolutely principles in legislation practice and kind of the modalities in secondary implementing regulations that should be regularly reviewed. Uh, and I think that that will probably serve it quite well. It is interesting that things get built outside government and taken into government almost with more success than they get built by government itself, uh, certainly in the procurement space. That that kind of intrigues me, as it were, in terms of the thread to pull on. And then um, more generally, we're talking about this kind of generation of new public financial management digital specialists and I, I thought that was an answer to your question sir about um yeah you're absolutely right to go beyond the finance ministry who's maybe more compliance based to really work with the problem holders from government and work backwards then on what that means so that going to the problem holders really matters we do that a bit in procurement where we have a kind of impact accelerator where it's like not always with procurement ministries it's directly with line ministries and what they're trying to execute and then um we were talking about the kind of uh, where we are at the OECD and elsewhere. It's it's fascinating, right? The we work globally, so yeah, I've talked to the UK government about procurement reform, or Ukraine, or Uganda, or somewhere else, and it's it's interesting seeing where the energy and reform is. So in Ukraine, for example, you could get a COVID-19 emergency contract kind of on your phone within like one day. Um, in the UK, it was 100 days and counting. And that really mattered during the, yeah, the, the whole COVID crisis in terms of PPE procurement. So what's fascinating to me globally is the answers aren't all you know, like a, uh, you know, in the OECD countries. It's this wonderful world of innovation out there. And that greatly excites me. Um, so I think there were other great questions that others will handle, but thank you. Um, great. Um, here's the alternative to you next uh, for your kind of concluding remarks. Um, but there was a comment earlier, I believe it was from Marco, that said very little is purely technical. Do you agree with that statement? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. I think the, you know, that that's the part of the challenge of it, isn't it? The, the science and the practice of public finance management is incredibly detailed, complicated, and um, kind of uh, precise. But it has huge each, each element of that process has huge significance for how we are managing grand strategic trade-offs in government between you know value for money and innovation or investment in one part of the system versus another or, and um you know a, a permitting innovation and decentralization versus having control and ability for the leaders to, to deliver their priorities so it's yes it's all it is all political and that is um 
that's partly why to come back to the previous question about the whole of government i would very much echo your comment in there that political will has got to be behind all of it so whether or not the impetus for reform comes from the finance ministry or from the kind of uh, head of state or government or whether there's a body that you know is overseeing it it just needs to have a huge dose of political capital behind it to to see it through um I was also going to pick up on what Gerardo said when you just casually said that, of course, CBDCs will transform the relationship between line ministries and um, finance ministries. And yeah, that, that blows my mind, that possibility. I think that's right. And uh, mini plug, we published a report by one of our fellows a couple of weeks ago about um, a kind of speculative look at budgeting on the blockchain um, in a scenario where you're able to do all your transactions, your financial transactions within the government ecosystem on a transparent a fully um, decentralized, fully transparent um, ledger. How does that transform the way organizations go about um, executing um, their budgets? Uh, I think it could be transformational. And, and I think that would have been my answer to your question, Mark, about where are the where would I put a bet on a big gain? I'm really optimistic about um, uh, improved transparency leading to improved practice and improved, um, improved accountability. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, it goes back to hearing about the example of um, you know publishing monthly transaction data in South Africa. You may not know at the time when you start to publish it who will pick it up and find it interesting and what organisations will spring up and be able to interrogate it and make use of it. But um, but it's absolutely worth doing because um, you know that that kind of thing um, is what can underpin a sort of um, you know a real step change in. Uh, the way governments are held to account in, in the way they manage product finances. So that's what makes me excited about it. Great. Um, we are just about to run over time. So, Anir, I do want to give you a chance to make some last remarks. I, I was going to turn to to Mark's comment there as well. Wh where do you see us as being able to make a big gain um, in the next couple of years? What What is something that you think might be achievable in the next five to 10 years? I think a lot can be achieved, actually. I think your point about everything is political, that's very true. Uh, but at the same time, I think we need to work at the science and the art of it. If art is politics and the technology is the science of it, I think science needs to go hand in hand with the art. Uh, we can't figure out the art from here because art is very context sensitive and it keeps changing maybe on a daily, weekly basis. But the science can sustain us for some time. I think we need to focus on the science and appreciate the art and make sure that art also happens. Uh, I'd like to make just two more comments on I think, Mark, you asked about uh, where we focus on. Uh, so I think getting early political win is important. So a report will not get a political win. I think one thing that will get political win in PFM space and also service delivery, both, is to digitize social safety nets. Because that's a big, we will touch on all the things. I mean, uh, the stack that I showed, ID, payments, data, service delivery. So we'll touch on all those things. And that's a worthwhile thing to do. Poverty elevation, political win, all of those can be achieved. So focusing on that is important. The last thing I'll just point out is the agile legal reform. I think the way I see it, it's very important. And we've done a lot of that in Bangladesh. The way I define it is that whatever is not prohibited is allowed instead of <laughs> focusing on what is allowed is allowed. So we just go with that. <laughs> Well, uh, that's a great point to uh, end us on. I'm gonna welcome Kaha Long from ODI back up to the stage to um, help us wrap up the session and indeed the whole conference. But I wanted to thank everybody for taking the time to uh, join us. I know it's been a long day, but um, we appreciate your interest in the topic. So.